Uh, welcome to Sci-Fi 2021, where today we have a special guest with us, uh, Janusz Krzyzewski, Secretary of State in the Chancellery of the Prime Minister of the Republic of Poland. Poland is a country we all know is a dynamic digital hub, and uh, there are very interesting things the government is doing. Uh, and Mr. Krzyzewski here is responsible for the entire digital portfolio of the Republic of Poland, and he's been coordinating activities aimed at ensuring cybersecurity and implementing government policy on all matters to do with cyber. Uh, so uh, I have a whole lot of questions for you. Let me start with uh, the whole idea of digital flows and the commodity that flows data. I mean, you can view this through a confusing set of multiple lenses. There is national security, there's economic competitiveness, there's a question of user rights, and each has its own set of conflicting demands. Now, what is the nature of this beast we call digital connectivity? Well, I think that uh, the dig digital connectivity is something that uh, is the blood flow of the economy and of the society uh, today. And this is something that we will uh, observe in the upcoming years, just like we did in the previous ones, uh, to grow. And I think the only limit of growth in the digital connectivity is the number of people, the number of entities, businesses that are in the world today. Because uh, I don't know if you, if you heard, but it took the radio uh, about 50, 30 years to gain 50 million users while Twitter gained 50 million users in nine months. So this shows that uh, the uh, velocity of uh, action is increasing and we will see that more and more thanks to the digital tools that we are developing all around the world and thanks to the fact that technology is more and more accessible uh, for people around the world. So as I said, uh, digital connectivity is something uh, I, I, I think we should compare it to a river. You cannot stop a river from flowing. You can try to regulate its current, uh, but often uh, you see that what, uh, what the state, what the, 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 the governments do, the, the effects do not last forever. And uh, we, have to, we have to adapt to the fact that the world is digital and will be more and more digital. And this is why I believe that uh, the nation and national states and the international organizations, uh, they, should be, uh, they, should, they should be like shepherds of this, uh, of this thing, because we, we can only guide the, the way the digital connectivity will develop, but we will never be able to control it. And I also believe that it's good, because this is also an instrument to uh, bring a democracy, to bring the, the values of many countries uh, in the world that have embraced democracy for years now uh, to the entire world, where it might not be that strong uh, after all. So I believe that digital connectivity is uh, something which will be uh, the groundwork, the foundation of how the world will work in the 21st century. And there are uh, a million aspects that we could talk about. and. Uh, I think that we could talk uh, all day, all night, and we still wouldn't have um, uh, captured all the important aspects of, uh, of this. So uh, I am, of course, willing to, you know, elaborate more on some particular examples. So if you, uh, so maybe, maybe if we could think of the ones that are the most important to you, then that's what we can uh, talk about. Uh, thank you. Uh, no, you said uh, digital connectivity, data flows are like a river. Yes, uh, we radiate data every minute of our lives. Uh, we as persons, we are become the river. The use and misuse of data leaking from our digital selves is becoming the defining question of our times. And uh, the European Parliament's Committee on Legal Affairs recently adopted the recommendations on the Digital Services Act, which include, you know, ban on behavioral tracking, analytics, a call for the right to use services anonymously. Now, in your opinion, and since you are in charge here, what are the regulatory tools and strategies available to rein in the power of large tech companies headquartered outside your jurisdictions? Now, should big tech really dictate what constitutes acceptable free speech on their platforms? It's a question of democracy. It's a question of what freedom of expression I have. Of course not. And uh, I believe that uh, uh, the days of uh, the ways of the big tech today, I, uh, I should uh, remind everyone that uh, Google, when it started, had this, uh, had this rule that it, it was one of their core values, their motto, don't be evil. 
And I don't know if you know that they actually changed that to something to be more uh, of, you know, a corporate uh, correct uh, uh, slogan. So I believe that the big tech from, from this, you know, uh, giant disruption from, uh, from something new, something that was meant to do only good, it has turned into just a regular business. And uh, since it's a business, it had to change the principles on, it, on which it operates. So um, this is why I believe uh, the, the big companies said, well, okay, so uh, we have to see what's good for our business and not necessarily for our users. So this is why uh, they have uh, put more and more effort into how uh, in, in, to not you know, enhance the experience for the user, but to enhance their business. And this is why um, uh, the, these issues regarding freedom of speech, regarding the processing of our data uh, have, uh, have been on the rise in the recent years. And it's like with any, any big, uh, big business. Um, you will probably remember how the telecoms uh, behaved at first. At first, everyone was, you know, extremely happy that they could have a mobile phone that, that you could uh, call uh, from anywhere uh, you went. But then the telecoms, they started to abuse their power. And what happened was the regulators came in and this happened on the European level, on the country level as well. And the regulators said, okay, so you cannot overuse your position. And today the telecoms, they come, come to the, our ministry and they say, you regulate us very heavily, but you have these OTT services that uh, are not regulated at all. So you should, you should do that. And I have to say they are right because uh, you cannot over, uh, you cannot uh, abuse your power. You, you cannot uh, overuse your uh, dominant position. And uh, we cannot say that uh, you know the technological platforms that they are neutral to our society. They are a vital element of everything that happens in our lives. And I believe that uh, they have to accept that with that comes uh, with, with the with, with the powers. It comes the responsibility, uh, and they have to they have to accept that, and they have to adapt to the values uh, of the countries that they operate in, and not uh, promote their own agenda because they are not nation states. They do not have the authority to do that. So that takes me to my next question. Uh, you spoke about. Uh, you know, national interest. But uh, my, my question is, does the idea of digital sovereignty really have any meaning? How does one expect or respect digital sovereignty? Uh, when one goes into issues of technology, the knowledge or digital infrastructure partnerships, uh, data flows, sharing, there is there is a whole lot of digital sovereignty which is under challenge, national sovereignty which is under challenge. Uh, how do regulators respond? Uh, I have to say that, you know, uh, usually sovereignty does not uh, come only from a nation's own strength, but it also comes from the strength of the partnerships that it, uh, that this, this nation can uh, establish. Because, you know, with uh, both our countries, they have their industries in which they are strong. But I believe that as well in Poland, as well as, well as in India, uh, you can probably hardly find anything that is a hundred percent national from from the first phase of development from the phase first phase of the product until it gets to the consumer and uh, no matter if it's you know if it's this sophisticated technology which uses chips that are usually made somewhere outside of our countries but also um, this uh, this also applies to even more basic uh, uh, parts of the economy, even you know, agriculture, uh, services, the, the, the ones for the people, they also, in many, many ways, they use the goods and services that they buy from uh, the part from outside of the, the country. So if you want to be sovereign, you have to maintain an ecosystem in which it is beneficial for, for the partners from around the world to cooperate with you and provide them with your products and, and services. So. I truly believe that there is a digital sovereignty which is to gain, and uh, but, but one should not make a mistake that we will be digitally sovereign if everything in our technology, from the fiber in the in the ground up to the you know, computers, the machines that we use to operate on this fiber, will be made in our country because 
the, this kind of autarky, I believe, is unsustainable and will never, and uh, will only, uh, you know, produce uh, the results that will, in the long run, uh, append the uh, aim, which is to be uh, sovereign, which means to me also being as strong as you possibly can with the uh, with the surroundings, with the uh, circumstances that are in place. Uh, linked to this very question of uh, digital sovereignty is also this entire issue of taxation. So we are in October 2021, and soon the G20 at the Leaders' Summit is expected to finalize this very contentious issue of equalization levies, Google tax, tax Netflix tax, call it what you will. Uh, there is now a proposal for a two-pillar solution, which says, first, okay, provide a fairer allocation of tax to the markets where all these big multinational digital companies are earning the most profits. And then there is a second part saying there's a global minimum tax of 15%. Now, how fair is fair? Uh, do we all agree? Does the EU, in fact, agree? I believe uh, Poland itself, I believe, had some initial reservations about this. Well, uh, this is, you know, there's a, the giant achievement of the United Europe is the single market on which we say that uh, it doesn't really matter if you operate in, in France, in Germany, in Poland, in Ireland, you are uh, eligible to uh, provide your goods and services to all European citizens. And this has been a, a source of a tremendous uh, success of uh, the European Union and Europe as a continent. But uh, as with all such agreements, uh, there is always incentive to, um, to find loopholes in that and uh, is creating inequalities, which I believe are not good for uh, not only for uh, countries like Poland, but also for the entire concept of the European Union. Because if one can see that um, one of our partners is blatantly abusing some power, some power he has, and for instance, we have countries that uh, have collected uh, the, the, the most of the tax taxes from the very large platforms that operate throughout the entire European Union, then I believe that this uh, this makes it uh, bad for the entire project because everyone thinks, well, okay, so why should, uh, if, you know, the barber shop, if the farmer, if the, uh, if the store is taxed uh, where, it, uh, where it belongs, where it operates, then why should these great businesses, which produce enormous margins, and you, you can hear with all these, uh, you know, documents that have leaked, that these these corporations they have uh, money offshore and money in the billions of dollars. So there's a there's tremendous profits that come from this kind of business, and we believe that they should be fairly and fairly, I mean, equally um, taxed. And uh, it's it's uh, you know. Uh, a situation in which one country offers uh, preferential taxation to uh, some kind of uh, some kind of business that operates in other countries is not good for everyone because uh, we should look at this issue on a European level. So we should go for the optimum uh, total amount of taxation throughout the European Union. And this total amount should also be equally and fairly distributed throughout the European Union. And the same, I believe, should apply to the entire world. And uh, I think it's a good direction that uh, we are looking at how profits from the most profitable entities in the world should be taxed. And I believe that if uh, these uh, companies, which have many, many, many times benefited from academia from uh, things that were previously funded by the state, they, they should return the favor and they should co contribute to the communities from which they derive their profits. And uh, this should be done in an equal manner and it should apply uh, not only to the digital companies for which this uh, is the, uh, this issue is the, I think the uh, most appalling because uh, you know they operate in cyberspace so it's hard to track them down and it's hard to say that you know that there is a physical presence somewhere uh, but i believe that this the, the, this can be accounted for and we can we can uh, work on a global system which will uh, equally and fairly allocate the benefits 
uh, that we have from developing a robust digital economy, which brings enormous profits. And you're confident that we are reaching there now, uh, that with the OECD proposals, we are very close to arriving at a consensus? I, I, I'm, to, I, I'm uh, patiently waiting for the OECD consensus. Uh, you know, as, as we know, in international relations, uh, FAIR is, uh, is a word and it's a concept which is understood differently. And since we know that uh, many of these companies are based in uh, countries that are very, have a very strong international position, there is most definitely going to be some kind of bias towards these economies from which uh, uh, that are the country of origin for for these platforms and maybe maybe it's, it's fair also because the, if these economies were the ones that uh, made made it possible to create such uh, such companies then maybe they should get some kind of extra credit for that but that cannot mean that they will reap all the profits and we should not let multinational corporations navigate through the global tax system because in the end this means that the total the total uh, taxation uh, is lower than it could be and uh, I, of course i'm not in favor of you know ri raising taxes to to some very high level but i i believe i strongly believe that taxation should be fair and fair means that uh, for, year, for many, many years, this has meant that taxes should be paid where the profits origin from. Uh, Excellency, Poland is hosting uh, the United Nations Internet Governance Forum this year. Yes. And uh, this is happening at a time when the pandemic has laid bare the vulnerabilities of our digital infrastructure everywhere, you know, even including in the most developed countries. We have experienced what the digital divide really means. So what can you know, countries do at a national, regional, global level? What are the priorities you would say uh, you know, Poland would be looking at in a world still grappling, coming out of COVID-19 in this situation? Well, I believe that uh, the, the, what happened uh, during the pandemic was that uh, we, we, we have learned a very, very, uh, a very, very hard lesson that uh, digital services are uh, a utility just like electricity, gas, and running water. And uh, if we fail to provide, uh, if we fail to provide this digital connectivity to all of our citizens, we will uh, we will face um, a crisis of inequality in access to very important public services. Because you know, in, if we were talking in 2019. We would say, okay, so we don't have the internet, so you don't have Netflix, and uh, you have to, you know, talk with your family members in the evenings instead of watching something interesting. Mm -hmm. And uh, in, in 2021, you can say you don't have internet. Well, then you you won't be able to work uh, with remote work. Your children will not be able to get their education because of the remote uh, uh, online uh, the classes that were held throughout the pandemic year. And uh, this has shown that um, this is extremely important. And this is why I believe that it is uh, now a global mission to uh, provide this, this basic level of sustain digital sustainability uh, for the underprivileged uh, people, for people that have not been able to uh, have not been able to benefit from the digital world because they were uh, they did not have the access to these most basic uh, services and, and goods. So I believe that um, we should we should really work on that. And uh, we have actually started a program in Poland for uh, children that come from um, areas of these uh, so-called uh, state-owned farms that were uh, that were. Uh, Mm, that, that, that were, you know, that, that they were all bankrupt after the changes in the Polish economy after the fall of communism, and these people were just left there without any support. And we see that 30 years after, we still can we can still uh, see that there is a significant development gap between the areas in which these farms were uh, held, were operated 30 years ago. So uh, this is an example how we provide the, the digital tools to the ones that did not have access to them, because we believe that without access to them, uh, they will not be 
be able to be uh, full members of our uh, digital society. And the digital society, I believe, is something that will stay with us after COVID. And I uh, and I strongly believe that uh, this uh, that this is this is uh, this should be an impulse to radically overhaul the way business is done, the way the government works, uh, and the, the way that the states, the, the national states operate. We, we should pursue a 100% digital uh, agenda. And uh, there is no, uh, the, the pandemic has proved that there is no room for development that is not uh, circling around the digital connectivity. So, so while on this subject, uh, can I quickly ask you, uh, what digital solutions did Poland use to respond better to COVID-19 and what was your experience? How effective or ineffective did you find them? So uh, we have um, actually just before the pandemic started, we have introduced uh, some e-health solutions that were proved extremely helpful throughout the pandemic because they enabled people to get through medicine, through, through electronic prescriptions, through uh, uh, things like that. But we also, uh, one thing that I believe uh, is very positive is that we, sh we showed us as a country that we can very quickly and very uh, successfully develop tools that are necessary to uh, combat uh, the pandemic. For instance, uh, when when, COVID, when the pandemic started, we, we closed our borders and we have uh, created a system for uh, border controls, which were you know, basically abolished within the EU um, after we entered uh, the European Union. So this was something that was just you know, created in, in days. And after, these, uh, after that, we were able to uh, start a launch a system that was uh, being used by thousands of people throughout Poland. Then when the vaccination campaign started, we, we were able to uh, deploy using cloud solutions. We were able to deploy uh, a vaccination registration system that started in just a couple of weeks and it proved extremely successful because uh, it was able to support uh, enormous traffic that would peak uh, in very, very high volumes. And we believe that this is something that that, that was you know very good for um, very good for us because it proved that uh, if we want to, then we can very quickly and effectively deploy sophisticated uh, IT solutions that will help us go through the pandemic. And uh, we may manage to de deploy uh, e-learning solutions, e-health. Uh, uh, we, we are working on uh, something that will stay with us after the pandemic which is the uh, the system for uh, remote work and education that will be uh, distributed for free throughout um, the entities in the administration the schools etc so i believe that uh, one one best uh, thing that happened to us throughout the pandemic uh, in terms of the digital world is the fact that we now um, changed our expectations because the society expects us to deliver these IT solutions very quickly and very uh, of very high quality. And we, as the public administration, can also say to ourselves, okay, so we are able to do that and we will be able to deliver as good as solutions as the ones that we made previously because we already proved to ourselves that uh, the, the state, the, the institutions have, a cap have the capacity to do so. Uh, as as a consequence of uh, COVID also, and uh, the kind of uh, techniques used, technology used, you know, certain countries were in a situation where citizens often resented the sweeping powers of governments uh, for pandemic control measures. What was uh, Poland's experience? Uh, and my next question, of course, is you know, how do governments, how do regulators create a regulatory environment that fosters trust amongst people. Now, and how do governments primarily gain that trust? So this is a very important issue because uh, I believe that uh, this is something that uh, we as Poland uh, also have to still still have to learn because we had good experiences at first, but then um, because when we had a rapid response to the pandemic, the people accepted that and they trusted the government. But uh, we experienced problems along the line as we progressed uh, because, because, you know, after time passes, uh, 
and people wanted more information from us. And I believe that in some in some ways we have failed to provide them uh, uh, on time and uh, of the quality that, that the society uh, needed. So this is something that we uh, need to work on. And I'm a strong advocate of, uh, you know, uh, defending your actions with the facts and the truth and the data that we have. And as a state, we're the holders of the biggest, uh, you know, data pool in the country. And we should uh, we should do more use of this and. Uh, provide this data with uh, good quality and, uh, and a reasonable explanation from people with authority that uh, the people that, that the society will trust to you know uh, guide them through difficult times and of course the covid uh, the covid pandemic was something where you know if you look at the medical recommendations that were here when the pandemic started they have developed very rapidly things that were for that in april 2020 were a dogma we now know are false and uh, people people that even uh, so, you know said that uh, these things then they did this in goodwill and the good faith but they still um, but they still didn't manage to uh, to maintain their authority because then new evidence came through and I believe that's something also which should uh, be a lesson that we should uh, sometimes uh, communicate uh, in a more, you know, uh, unsure manner. We should we should say that this is what we know at the moment, but this can change, and there can be new scientific evidence that will come and that will say that while what we said was uh, we believe true and uh, uh, we were you know um, truthful in presenting this kind of data at the moment the situation can change and the new evidence can uh, falsify what we thought was true just a couple of months ago uh, we are running out of time so i think i've just uh, space enough to squeeze one last question to you minister okay. uh, you know the pandemic has exposed the importance of technology, the centrality of technology, and we are, as you yourself said, ready to leap into the next phase. Things are changing very, very fast. Infrastructure is going to be critical. Infrastructure is crucial. The expansion of infrastructure is crucial. Uh, Poland has yet to tender, I think, 5G frequencies. And uh, yeah. after you know the, the cancellation of one license, now how how will you respond? How is what is your response, your country's response to questions around the security of data, as well as infrastructure relating to 5G networks? And are there particular high risk vendors? And if so, if there are high risk vendors, what is your policy towards them? What should be countries' policies towards them? any country? I believe that I believe that every country should have the possibility to exclude the high-risk vendors because uh, you know we can be naive and say that well it's technology it's neutral it doesn't uh, it doesn't matter what kind of equipment we we buy we just need to provide the services as fast as possible but of course to anyone who uh, who, who thinks uh, for for just a minute longer it's obvious that uh, the technology has nationality and you have to look at that and uh, technology comes with risks, and it's also a very big investment. So once this investment is made, it's not easy to say, well, okay, so now I'll just uh, uh, scrape billions of dollars in infrastructure and uh, buy a new one. That, that's not possible. So this is why we believe that the high-risk uh, high vendors uh, is a concept that should be uh, in place in every legal system. But on the other hand, we believe that this is a process that should be in the hands not of politicians, but of experts. Because just like with uh, the pandemic, just like we talked before, uh, th there should be experts in, in charge of this pandemic uh, response. And there should be experts in charge of deciding which technology poses a risk or a threat uh, to, uh, to, to, to the country. So for, for my... As for my position, I want to focus on providing the Polish state with the tools necessary to make a smart choice of the technology and to prevent uh, these high-risk vendors from entering our market. But I believe it's also my responsibility to provide independent experts that will be able to decide who uh, is actually and why and to be able to 
uh, should provide very good arguments for that, uh, why a certain com com company should be uh, thought of as a high-risk vendor. Uh, thank you so much, Minister. I think you covered you. such a vast, vast range of questions in 30 minutes. I would not have expected, you know, that we would have covered so much ground, uh, right from the pandemic thank to regulation to responses. It was, it was a pleasure talking to you, and this has really been a great contribution to Sci-Fi 2021, which ORF is hosting. Thank you, thank you for being with us. Thank you very much. Have a nice day.